fish on uh, a topic um, which is, I think, very interesting. Anastomosis insufficiency and fistula after primary treatment for prostate cancer. Margaret, how often do we see these problems? First of all, dear friends, uh, there's nothing to add to what previous speakers already said. It's a great meeting, uh, great social events, great sunshine. Thank you for being part of the faculty. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard quite a lot about uh, diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer. So what I, what I would like to do is to discuss two problems of the treatment with you, anastomotic insufficiency and fistula. Do we have the pointer anywhere? disappeared. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so anastomotic leakage means at least the patient has had a radical prostatectomy and it is the most common short-term complication. However, looking into the literature, you find quite a wide range of incidents, 0.3 to 15.4, and one of the reasons is that there is no strict definition. Should every anastomosis be watertight? Or starting from which post-operative day we speak or we say, define at least, this is a leakage, then is there a certain amount of extravasation? And shall we just classify an anastomotic leakage when it needs further treatment? So there are some risk factors, and you can see patient-related risk factors like obesity, but also prostate size, previous prostatic surgery, but the most important risk factors are type of anastomosis, the technique, whether you make an inversion of the mucosa or not, the sutures you use, the number and type, and also whether it was difficult to do the anastomosis, and especially if the anastomosis was performed under tension. Further risk factors are blood loss, intraoperative flush test positive, postoperative urinary tract infection, and also the type of catheter seems to play a role. So the diagnosis mainly is done by a high drain output, and if you have creatinine in that fluid, then you are sure you have a leakage and you can make a VCUG or retrograde urethrogram at least, and then you get the diagnosis. These investigations are described in the literature to be helpful. I don't think you need it in the majority of cases. So is there any difference of the operative technique concerning the incidence of an anastomotic leakage? And this is a quite actual review and meta-analysis comparing open radical prostatectomy, laparoscopic pro radical prostatectomy, and robotic-assisted radical prostatectomies. And here you see the figures, and you see there is a clear difference. That means in the minimal invasive techniques, anastomotic leakage seems to be less often. What is the therapy? This is straightforward. In the majority of cases, a prolonged drainage leaving the catheter in is the treatment uh, of choice. There are only rare cases that need at least re-anastomosis. To my opinion, these are cases where you have a complete rupture of your anastomosis, and you should, if you diagnose it, you should do it early. After three weeks, you get inflammation in that area, and if you go in after three weeks and do a reanastomosis, it will fail. And you should consider the reasons for leakage. If it was obesity, if it was already done uh, under tension, maybe it's better to wait for three months and then go in and do the reanastomosis. What you have to keep in mind is if you have an extravasation, you have a high risk for the development of a secondary anastomotic stricture, and you have a higher risk of incontinence. Now we are coming to a more difficult topic, the fistulas. And as you can see, the etiology is not only radical prostatectomy, it's also other therapies, radiotherapies, cryotherapies for prostate cancer, but we clearly can state that 
treatment of prostate cancer is the most common cause for the development of fistulas in males. Again, the same review and meta-analysis. Is there a difference in between the operative techniques? Here you see the values, and you clearly can say that laparoscopy is worse. So you have a significant higher risk for development of a urethral fistula when a laparoscopic radical prostatectomy is performed in comparison to open surgery. However, the good news is it's a very rare complication. And when we see the incidence, it's 0.1 to 1%. And again, we have risk factors, advanced disease, irradiation, rectal injury during surgery, status post-TURP, and salvage radical prostatectomy, because in salvage radical prostatectomy, the incidence of rectal injury is quite high. When we look to irradiation therapy, you see that after prachytherapy, the incidence, if it's a monotherapy, is quite comparable to radical prostatectomy. However, if you have a combined therapy or even a salvage, then you get quite high risk for development of fistulas. There, are, there is the number of focal therapy increasing in the literature. However, at this moment, we don't have really large series, and especially we don't have a long follow-up. What we can say that even after this focal therapy, we see, especially after cryotherapy and HIFU, we see fistulas, and these are complex fistulas, as I will show during my presentation. This was very interesting. When you analyze the literature, <coughs> you see that before 1997, only about 4% of the fistulas were irradiation-induced. And since 1998, we have a clear increase. Today, approximately 50% of radi uh, fistulas are radiation-induced, and in that recent review from Hechenpleikner out of the year 2013, even 61.5 of the patients with fistula were irradiated. So that means we have an increase of radiation-induced fistula, and this means we have a shift to more complex fistula. And this has an influence on the management. Back to the classification. Vesico-rectal fistulas you normally have after bowel surgery. <coughs> or in patients with bowel disease. And this is the typical urethral fistula after treatment for uh, prostate cancer. And complex fistula, I want to classify a little bit further. So what are complex fistula? It's defined as status post prachytherapy and external beam radiation and focal therapy. Also fistulas that have, in addition, uh, a urethral stricture or a complete stricture of the anastomosis, larger fistulas, larger than two centimeters, and what we see quite often now after focal therapy is such tissue damage with cavity and fibrosis, and of course, if you have a sphincter damage and a small bladder capacity. What are the investigations? It's important if you do a cystogram to have a lateral view, to see the exact localization of the fistula. And after radical prostatectomy, normally this is in the area of the anastomosis. For the complex fistula, an MRI is very helpful to see this cavity formation, and sometimes you see an inflammation also of the pubic bone. Also, rectoscopy and cystoscopy might be of help. I don't find, find the bowel investigation with contrast media very helpful or a CT. What are the therapeutic options we have? Fistula closure in the so-called symbol fistulas, and we have different approaches, the abdominal, perineal combined approach, the trans anorectal or perianorectal approaches are mainly used by rectal surgeons or surgeons, and these are the approaches that reconstructive urologists prefer. You can 
interpose additional tissue like omentum or crassilis, and this should be done in patients that had previous radiotherapy or have complex fistulas. And of course, there are some cases they need a salvage postetectomy, and some also will end in a urinary diversion. <laughs> Concerning the different approaches, if you choose an abdominal approach, you have the disadvantage that your fistula is on the backside of the anastomosis, deep in the pelvis. That means you have to reopen re -open the anastomosis to stent the ureter and then close the fistula, but there is a big advantage. It's easy to dissect from that approach the crater omentum and put it as a flap and additional tissue in between. The perineal approach has some advantages. It's the same as approach as for a perineal radical prostatectomy. You have an excellent position. You are exactly at the point where the fistula is. However, the disadvantage is that there is not much local tissue that is well vascularized. You can use a, f a fat flap, pedicled fat flap for interposition, but this only works in non-irradiated patients. If you have irradiated patients, then you need the, muscle, the gracilis muscle in addition. Let's have a look to the literature, and I have considered the publication uh, that were presented during the last eight years. <coughs> starting from the year 2006, and what you clearly can see that the number of cases is quite small. However, the good news is that the success rate is very high, 78 to 100 percent. Same is true for the more recent series, and here I have included our own data, which we presented in the year 2010. Again, small overall numbers, however, high success rates ranging in between 75 and 100 percent. But this is an excellent review I already cited from Hessian Pleikner. And 26 articles were included, 460 patients, 40 percent of the patient had irradiation. So small amount pelvic irradiation, around one-third brachytherapy, and 42 percent combination therapy. What you can see that is that the preferred surgical approach is the transperineal approach, especially in the high volume centers with tissue flap. I already mentioned the reason why. Um, for tissue interposition, mainly the gracilis muscle was used. And as I already said, the success rate is very high. And there is no difference, at least, in between patients with and without irradiation concerning the success of fistula closure. And now comes the but. At least in the non-irradiated patient, a permanent urinary diversion was only necessary in 4%. However, in the irradiated, in 42%. Same is true for fecal diversion, non-irradiated group around 4%, irradiated patients 25%. And this you will find also in the literature, uh, a publication out of the year 2008. 25 patients, 17 with radiation and ablation-induced fistulas. Again, successful fistula in closure in all. But of these 17 with this history, seven have incontinence, four urethral strictures, two devastated outlet, and four, six fecal incontinence. And factors predisposing to poor urinary and fecal outcomes were large fistulas and irradiation or cryotherapy. This publication also mirrors that, and this is the publication of, of Leo Zinman with the highest number of cases. 39 had radiation ablation-induced fistulas, and you can see that 72 had a single gracilis flap, 23 uh, two gracilis flaps, and the success rates was very, very high. And again, the but. Of those with radiation, ablation-induced fistula, 
seven post-operative strictures, five prolonged suprapubic cystostomy drainage, four delayed permanent urinary diversion, and five secondary artificial sphincter implants due to urinary incontinence. So, despite a very good success rate for fistula closure, a majority of these complex patients will need a high number of further interventions. What are the indications for salvage prostatectomy? And these are patients in whom prostate was not removed and have, like this patient here, a complete stricture of the prostatic urethra. However, there should be no larger cavity formation, and in these cases, I always would recommend to do a perineal approach with a Cresselis flap. If you consider an, a mental approach, abdominal approach, you should use the omentum as interposition. There are at least no data, so I just can refer to the data on salvage prostatectomy, and I just want to focus on this recent review. So there is a high complication rate. As already mentioned, the incidence of rectal injury during salvage prostatectomy is up to one-third. Anastomotic stricture following the intervention, 7 to 41 percent, and a quite high rate of incontinence, at least requiring a secondary implantation of an artificial urinary sphincter. So you have a high complication rate, and as I mentioned, for fistula repair, there are almost no data. There is only the publication of Tony Mandi and Daniela Endridge. They presented 23 patients post-radical prostatectomy with a fistula, 17 post-irradiation, and you see in eight, so quite small number, they performed a salvage prostatectomy and they preferred the retropubic approach with omentum flap and did only one case from a perineal approach. So going a step forward, who will need a cystoprostatectomy and urinary diversion? And these are the cases I already mentioned with cavity formation large fistula, small bladder capacity, and incontinence, and you see this severe extravasation. What type of urinary diversion? I personally prefer bowel segments out of the irradiation field, and I will show you some data when you use the classical type of urinary diversion. That means I prefer either the transverse conduit as an incontinent diversion or a transverse pouch as a continent diversion. And the rational is that the complication rate, if you use standard technique like ileal conduit, pouch, or orthotopic neobladder, is increased. In this study, out of the year 2010, the overall complication rate was 77%. Normal complication rate for this material is around 30%. This is another example out of the year 2008, and you see the majority of patients irradiated, 44 early, 51 late complications. And again, this all irradiated overall complication rate 76. The gynecologists have some experience in heavily irradiated patients with the transverse conduit, and you see that the complication rates of quite a large series of patients with cervix carcinoma with a high uh, uh, dose of irradiation was quite good. And these are the data out of the transversum pouch. This is our own series here. You also see that for an irradiated group, the complication rate is really acceptable. This is a typical case. Um, it is a 62-year-old patient who had a radical prostatectomy in the year 1999, followed by external beam radiation. He, uh, he developed a stricture of the anastomosis, had at least three TURs, and then followed by rectoplater fistula, perineal abscess, and incontinence. So first we did an abscess drainage and colostomy, and then later on performed a cystectomy, a transverse conduit, and we were able to close his colostomy. So how many patients will need a urinary diversion or will end up in a urinary diversion? And it's very difficult to get some figures out. When I look to our own data, I would say around 10% need a urinary diversion, 
However, when we consider the irradiated patient, around 67%. And in the other studies, it really depends on the amount of irradiated patients. So it's anywhere in between 18 to 91%. To summarize, anastomotic leakage is the most common short-term complication. We have no strict definition, and therefore we have quite a wide range of incidents. It seems to be lower in minimal invasive techniques, and the major impact as risk factor is the anastomosis, how this is performed, and the suture material. Diagnosis is quite easy with strain output and avoiding cystogram, and the therapy in most of the cases is prolonged drainage. Concerning rectourethral fistula, it's rare. However, it's a severe complication. We have some risk factors, and today around two-thirds of the fistulas we see are irradiation-induced. This means we have a shift to more complex fistula. Um, High-volume centers prefer the perineal approach with tissue interposition, and commonly the muscle is muscle is used. We have a quite high success rate for fistula closure, However, uh, despite a comparable rate for non-irradiated and irradiated patients, the irradiated patients have a higher complication rate. That means around 40% will end in a permanent urinary diversion and 25% with a fecal diversion. And when you consider the initial therapy, please maybe consider high urinary diversion for this complex collective more often, because then you can solve the problem with one operation. Thank you. Margaret, thank you very much for this excellent overview. Are there any questions? Well, I, I have a question. Um, for the um, anastomosis, how long does it take before it's really healed? I mean, the question is, when should we remove the catheter? There is a tendency to remove the catheter earlier and earlier, and there are some people, they say, we can remove the catheter after three or four days, but how long does it take time for the healing process? I have no answer to that. I mean, when we consider the end-to-end -end anastomosis in uh, urethral stricture patients, we know that after uh, seven days, there is a complete healing in about 90% of cases, but this these are normally young patients. If you have an, a patient for a radical prostatectomy, this patient normally is older, and you have to consider comorbidities like diabetes because in those patients, wound healing at least takes much longer. So I think it's individual, and the shortest time period I would suggest is seven days to be on a safe side. Yeah? If you make a watertight anastomosis, Maybe you can do it after four days. I wouldn't do it. I would really say shortest time is seven, but it can be up to at least three to four weeks when we make a complex re-anastomosis mm. for a stricture. Then we have the catheter in for three weeks. We always do avoiding cystogram, and I would say in these cases, we also see a 90% success rate without extravasation after three weeks. Okay, Pete. Margaret, as perfect as I expected. Congratulations, it was very good. I have a question concerning the irradiation um, problem. Two thirds, you said, of uh, the fistulas are induced by irradiation. Can you differentiate whether it's external beam, IMRT, or whether it's brachytherapy? Because we see a lot of brachytherapy uh, patients, and as you know, where I do surgery on or not, and in our institution, they are very keen and do a lot of these brachytherapy. Um, uh, things and I rarely see a fistula so I guess it's basically or most of the time IMRT or external beam radiation or am I wrong? Uh, normally it's a combination therapy uh, as I showed if you take the brachytherapy alone that that was one of the initial slides the uh, incidence of the fistula is the same as for radical prostatectomy. Okay. If these are combination therapies then it is increasing and especially for salvage therapy. Thanks. Thanks for the great talk. Um, you very 
neatly pointed out that you need to use transverse colon to do a continent or a wet diversion. How do you consider reconstructing a continent diversion with a uh, transverse colon? <laughs> I have to go back <laughs> to show you the slide. Because you have, because it, if you use the yeah. right colon, then you can use the, the Indiana pouch, but if with the transverse you, colon. You use either the ascending or transverse or the transverse descending um, segment. Then you open and you leave at least uh, the last 12 centimeters intact. You tailor the last 12 centimeters and then you implant it in the suture line. That's the technique what Hassan Abulenin is using for ureteral implantation. It's called the serous lined extramural tunnel. And he's using the same technique for the, uh, for the ileal pouch. And that's the technique we used. We in initially started with an isolated additional segment, but then you have two bowel anastomosis. And this here is much easier. So you tailor it over an 18 French catheter and you make the windows and you use it like an appendix stoma. So it's in continuity and because it's incorporated into the pouch wall, you have a, a pressure transmission uh, to, to the continence mechanism and that's the valve principle, which is one of the best continence mechanism we have in continent urinary diversion. Good. Any more questions? Well, if this is not the case, well, thank you very much for